Welcome back, part six in the Lee Jig series. Today we're looking at through dovetails. Is that sounds interesting? Stick around. So we're now at the point where our cabinet is glued up, and today we're going to start the work on the drawer unit. I'm going to use blind dovetails at the front of the drawer and through dovetails at the back of the drawer. That's a very typical traditional technique for drawer making. So today we're going to look at the back of the drawer and those through dovetails. Our through dovetail instructions start on page 19, chapter 8 of the manual. And on the first page, as usual, it's one, two, three steps that just gives you the basic outlines basically we cut the tails we turn it over we cut the pins and magic happens marvelous we then get into a bit more detail and the instruction manual starts to talk a little bit about the dovetail terminology now in any dovetail joint you have a tail and you have a pin the tails easy to identify because it looks like a dove's tail hence the name of the joint and the pin is the part that fits in between the dovetails. You'll also hear sockets, which I think is a more meaningful name. The socket is the thing that the dovetail slides into. So on the diagram, it's talking about that terminology. And here you can see these are our dovetails. And here you can see that these here are the pins. And just for information, the space between the pins are known as the sockets. And over here, there's another diagram of the joint coming together. And you can clearly see the dovetails here and then the pins in between those dovetails. And if you just look at that joint for a second and just imagine the tensions on that when the drawer's in use, you can probably see that if I put pressure onto this piece of wood here on the joint, that joint will easily come apart because those tails will slide directly out of the sockets. However, if I put pressure in this direction, you can see that the wedge shape of those dovetails will resist that pull. And it's important that you think about those pressures on your final product when you're working out what's a pin and what's a tail. Now, I've already gone ahead and I've cut the material to size and I've got a front, a back and two sides of my drawer unit and as always I've marked a reference edge that I used to cut to this material and I'll work on the reference edge throughout this project as well so everything should in theory line up and my drawer will come together in this direction. So I want this board to be my tail board so it slots in to the sockets between the pins on this pin board it will slot in like this and therefore when I'm putting the drawer in this direction the joint will tighten because of the wedging action that we saw here. So your tails are normally the sides of your drawers and your pins are normally the front and back of the drawers. Now I say normally there and I've never yet come into a situation where you'd want to reverse that. I have seen some YouTubers reverse that and say they were doing it for cosmetic reasons because it looked different and they wanted it to be different and there's not much strain on the drawers. I just think that they made a mistake. So typically your tails are your sides, your pins are your front and back on a drawer. And remember that you're not going to go far wrong. In this comment down here, it also says the pins fit into the pin sockets. Ooh, okay. Well, we think the tails fit into the pin sockets and the joint should almost always end each side with a half pin and that we agree with. And if you look at this pin board here, you can see there's a half pin here and a half pin there. And that again is good practice. And when you're designing your drawers and the joints on the drawers, try and get your half pins the same sort of size. Somewhere around about five to six millimeters is a good size for a half pin. It looks good and it's got enough structural integrity inside that to hold the joint together. So that's the terminology it's talking about. You're a tail, you're a tail board, you're a pin, you're a pin board, you're a socket, you are a half pin. So now you know the terminology. Now Lee come out with some marking systems on here and you can see they've got these squares with arrows on them. 
If you look in the preface of the manual, you can see this section, which way round should the boards go. And in here, they illustrate what they're doing with these symbols. What they're doing is basically drawing a square box, like that, and then they're indicating which board you're using. So if I'm using this front board here, then that's saying that's my front board on the outside edge. Similarly, this, what this joint is saying, that's the inside face of my side piece. And they use those symbols throughout the box. So on my tailboard, you can see they're indicating a square as an inside face. On my pin board, they're indicating a square with an outside face. And that's the terminology that they are using. And if you've not got your own terminology, then that's probably not a bad one to follow. I tend to use a different terminology, and it's one I've just used for forever, so it works for me. I already know my reference edges because of my arrows, and I can just write on the outside. You're going to be the back of my draw, so therefore you're going to be a pin board, and that's the outside face, and you are the rear of my draw. So I now know you're the pin board, you're the face, you're the rear of my draw, and that's the top because I've indicated it with my usual markings. So this one is another pin board. This is also going to be the face because I like the look of it. And you are my front of my draw. You are a tailboard. You're going to be my side. And you're the right hand tailboard and you are my face and you are a tailboard you're my left tailboard and you're my face now I just find that easy because it's exactly what it says on the tin so when I come to assemble this you're my face you're my rear pin board you're my face you're my right tailboard you are my face, you're my left tail board, and you are my pins, and you're my face, you're my front pin board. So you're going to go together like that. So it's up to you, of course, what terminology you use. I just find that easier to track because I understand it better. And typically when we're using the lead dovetail jig, our faces are always going to be facing towards me, the operator, facing away from the jig, so in theory, everything should work out. So we've now got the terminology understood and we've identified what's going to go where. We've set up the router, all our boards are square, so now we can move to the dovetail jig. So we now want to place the finger assembly on our back of board in the through dovetail pin mode, flat on the spacer board, and with a scale set to 12.7 millimeters. So we're now looking for this symbol. It's the grey scale is going to go to the right hand side. And it's a picture here of the pins. You can see the half pin, you can see the full pin, you can see the socket in between. And we want to set this to the 12.7 millimeter mark. And luckily there's a line scored across there that makes it easy to find that measurement. So as always, we line that up with the marks on the support brackets, like so. So even though we've got the jig set up in the pin mode, it's now saying that we want to clamp a tail board to lay these things out. So we'll take a tail board, my face is facing me, and my reference edge is towards the outside of the clamp. And we bring that up and lock it into place. Now the reason that we're going to use the pin mode to lay out the tails is it's easy to visualise the final design and also it puts the screws on the top which helps when you're adjusting the fingers. So now we just lay out for this joint. Just raise up the fingerboard a little bit, that just makes it easier to adjust. Take your first finger and you want to set it towards the edge of your board. And ideally, you want the end of this finger, this side here, to be about three millimeters from that board edge. And it's not critical, so somewhere about there is going to be, that's a world's smallest three millimeters, somewhere about there is going to be good. And then you're simply going to lay these out in the pattern that you want to see your joints. 
and actually that pattern looks pretty good so i'm going to have three pins on this overall and three tails and you can see with my fingers in that configuration i get more or less an equal half pin at either side you could equally say do you know what i don't want that design what i'd like to have is a design that's more like that and you could then go for a two pin design or a two dovetail design if you really wanted to you could go for a one pin design so that's the good thing about the lee jig and when it talks about that infinitely variable dovetail this is what it's talking about most jigs in fact every other jig on the market apart from the lee jig has what's known as fixed and that means that you size your board to the fixed pattern of dovetails that the jig will give you lee's the only one that i know of comments in below if there's another jig on the market that does this that gives you the ability to control that pattern so what i really like about the lee for the dovetails and the blind dovetails will be the same of course is i can now size my boards to my project and adjust my joinery to the size of the board and that's the type of freedom that i want so i made no design considerations at all in our box for the size of this opening because i knew i could just vary my dovetails to suit that opening size and that's what we're doing here that's a huge benefit of the lee jig and a thumbs up for that design innovation but i don't want one joint i want to have three joints because i can so i'm just going to adjust these two end fingers so it gives me something like that so it just looks nice and equal and now i'm going to tighten everything into place so that's it so when i route my pins you can see it's going to take out the middle part of this wood leaving two half pins on either side perfect now don't forget when we route this we want to make sure that the route is supported on this side of the joint so we loosen off a number of these fingers and we're just going to bring those in to support the router base and although it's not discussed in the manual i'm just going to bring a set of fingers up to rest on this end of the backer board as well and that will just make sure that my fingers are lying flush when i push this bar down that's it this is my layout i have a fixed finger here to support the router plate i've got the fingers in the middle that's going to dictate my joint pattern I have a number of fingers just placed wherever it looked good to support the router on this side of the cut and a reference finger here to support the finger assembly on the board to make sure it doesn't twist happy days now we're going to route the tails first and don't forget we've set this up in the pin mold because it's easy to visualize the joint and access the screws so now we take this off and we just turn it over like this you're not going to turn this end for end you're just going to turn it over and put it back on again and on here you've got a greater or equal to sign and it's 26 millimeters now you want to set this at that point now that mark there that greater than 26 millimeters ensures that your router bit is going to pass all the way through the wood and that's what we want for our through dovetails so line that up and lock it down and now you can bring your fingers down press them securely onto your wooden board make sure it's all clamped into place now i just want to make sure that i'm in the right orientation for my tail board yes my face is facing me and my reference edge is correct and i'm just going to make sure that this is butted up hard underneath these fingers and it's all in place like so and that looks good to me now if you saw the episode after the box tails we looked at some techniques for reducing tear out and i want to apply those same techniques here so i'm going to bring up my backer board so it's flush with the back of my material and lock that into place and that will stop tear out at the back and i just want to clamp another board here at the front to stop tear out at the front so you can see that this is now firmly clamped between a backer board and a front board which should stop tear out and we're going to route out the space in between these as we move forward now because i've got the front board in place there's no need for a climb cut so my bush can just simply run around these fingers and the job is 
good. Now depending on your layout, you may have gaps between these fingers. If you look over here as an example, you could see there's gaps between these fingers. So there's a great potential when you're routing for your router to come round and then inadvertently go down the gaps in between these fingers. And if you do that, your joint is ruined. So the kit comes with a couple of lengths of black plastic that looks like this in profile and you cut these to the length that you want and over time you end up with lots of short lengths that are well worth keeping. Now what you do with these, if you wanted to block off this hole here so I don't want to route down, you cut this to the appropriate length and that slots in between the fingers and now your bush will come down, run round here run across the edge of your plastic and down here. And that just prevents you cutting out the, the space between the fingers, which is not something you want to do. So that's what those black things are for, and that's how you use them, simples. So with all our jig set up, anything ready to cut, we now just need to set the router up. So we now need to choose the right bit selection to make our joint. On page 73 in appendix 2 of the manual, you've got a section that talks about bit selection. And you choose the bit for your through dovetails depending on the thickness of your stock. And it here talks about a number of the bits. Now you're going to be using two bits to make a through dovetail. You'll be going to use a dovetail bit and you're also going to be using a straight bit. It's not super clear, but it really, really, really is easy. We know that we're working with an 18 millimeter stock and I want to be able to cut through 18 millimeters because that's going to be the distance between my shoulder and the top of my tail. So therefore I want to be able to choose something that's got a depth of cut of greater than 18 millimeters. And Lee have a number of options, an 88 bit, a 75, eight bit and a 70 8 bit, a 68 bit and a 58 bit and in this appendix they talk about the depth of cut and you're looking at this distance here B. So a number 88 bit would give me a cutting range of 13 to 20.6 millimeters. A number 75 8 bit will give me a cutting range of 9.5 to 16 millimeters. A number 70-8 bit will give me a cutting range of 6 to 13 millimetres. A number 60-8 bit will give me a cutting range of 9.5 millimetres. And a 50.8 will give me a cutting range of 6.35 millimetres. So you simply choose the combination depending on your thickness. So 18 millimeters, that's between 30 and 26. So the only dovetail bit I can use is 80-80, simples. There's then an associated straight bit, in this case it's the 148. So my two bits are 80-8 and straight cut bit 140-8, both of which come with the DR4 Pro kit and then over here on the right hand side it talks about the guide bush diameter you can use the e7 and we know we don't like the e7 and the e7 bush is not used in either the blind dovetails or the through dovetails to tighten the joint up so it's a bit redundant so we can also go ahead and use our other bit the 11.1 millimeters that's already fitted to the router so we're in good shape i need the 80-8 and the 140-8 bits for this job so with all that said let's set up our router now with the router bit in place we now come along and set the depth of cut and remember we just simply use our stock to bring it flush to the top of the joint and draw a line and then we use that line on the front to set the depth of the router so the next job is we can go through and we can route this out, both ends of this and also both ends of the other tailpiece. So we set this up, we cut all the tailpieces, let's get that done. So you can see we end up with these rather nice dovetail shapes in our board. So with that done, we just come back and route everything else out. You can see we now end up with our tail boards looking pretty good. So our tail boards are done. Excellent. 
So we've now got to look at the pin. So job one is we turn the finger assembly around to the pin mark. And it tells us to set the spacings to one increment more than the 12.7 mark. So we go back to the 12.7 mark, which is there, and now I take that to one increment past. So that is now reading round about 13 millimeters. And then we just lock that into place and repeat on this side here, like so. Now let's see if we can work out how this works. I'll put our board into place just for illustration. Now, this section looks incredibly complicated when you first read it, and that's because it's trying to give you a lot of information. And similarly, the gauge here looks quite complicated as well, but it's not really. This wedge is showing you the different diameters of the bits that you're likely to use. And remember in the appendices, we went through those different bits and the thickness of the material that they worked with. This gauge is giving you the same information again, just a bit more condensed and a bit more complicated. Now what this scale is showing you are the different bit sizes that you can use, 9.5, 11.1, 17.5, 12.7 and 20.3. And those numbers relate to the diameter of the bit taken at its widest point, i.e. the base. And then it's referencing on this scale here the straight cut bit that you should be using. If you're using a 9.5 millimeter bit, or an 11.1 millimeter bit, or a 12.7 millimeter bit, then you're under this line here in this yellow zone, and therefore you need to be using a 7.9 millimeter straight cut bit. If you're using a 17.5 millimeter diameter dovetail bit, then you're in this zone here, and you should be using a 12.7 millimeter straight cut bit. If you're in a 20.3, which is above this line here, you should be using the 11.1 millimeter straight cut bit. And remember in the appendices, we went through those different bits and the thickness of the material that they worked with. This gauge is giving you the same information again, just a bit more condensed and a bit more complicated. And that's all that scale is telling you. And this section here makes that a little bit too complicated, but that's all it is. And if you've used those appendices that we've used to give you the bit, you can ignore that anyway, because we know what size the bit is. What's more important to understand is how it's going to work. Now your bush on the bottom of the jig is going to run through these fingers. And as you can see, they have a slope inside them. Now it's that slope that now dictates how tight your joint's going to be. If I move this back, you can see I'm going to cut out more of that pin socket. If I move this forward, you can see I'm going to cut out less of this pin socket. And it's that simple, really. So you make some test cuts and you adjust this to give you the final fit. So we start our cut at the increment above the dovetail position. So we know we're using a 12.7, so I'm starting at the increment above. If you were using a 9.5, you'd start at the increment above. 11.1, the increment above. Now that will guarantee that your joint is going to be too tight, and then we'll adjust the fingers to tighten that up. And if we start with the joint too tight and creep up to the fit, we can get away with one test piece of material. If we started too loose, we would have to use a different test piece of material. So we'll set our fingers in the first place, one increment above 12.7, which is going to be there. And now make sure that my fingers are nice and firm down onto that backer board. I'm just going to come in with a scrap piece of wood. I don't care if this is too wide, as long as it's 18 millimeters, because we'll just fit our joint in like this and test it for fit. And for the test piece, I'm not worried about the the front tear out, so we'll just come in like so. Changing my route a bit over for the 140.8, which is a 7.9 millimeter straight cut bit. Just come in with a piece of stock so I can set the depth of my bit, set my depth of cut, and then we can come through and we can cut this out for a test fit. So that's it, you can see we have our pins cut. Half pin here, there'll be an equivalent half pin here, and then the sockets in between. And this obviously fits in like 
this. So, it's now a matter of testing that fit. And straight away, although it's going to go in, that is a little bit too tight. So, we're just going to loosen the joint off a little bit and try that again. Now, because the joint's too tight, I can reuse the same scrap piece of wood. Put it back into position, mount it against the end, and just clamp that down. So I want to loosen the joint. So I want to cut more into these pins than we did on that test cut. So I simply move these backwards, away from me to loosen the joint, towards me to tighten. And you can see, that's just changing the distance between here in relationship to my joint. So, we're one increment above 12.7 now. So actually, let's come back and try, bang on, 12.7. So I've literally moved that back 0.25 of a millimetre. And now I can remake this cut. Now that really just did take off the lightest of cuts. So now we can try our joint again. And there you go. That's not a bad joint. Now, I'm not sure if you can see, it's not quite deep enough, so I just need to plunge the router down a little bit more. But apart from that, it's looking pretty good. Tear out here at the front from when we routed that, but we didn't protect it in any way, so that's okay. So what I can now do is just plunge the router down a little bit, and I'll recut this again. Not gonna adjust these, I'm happy with the fit. And I'll recut this again, just see if we can get this level. And there you go. You can see that's made a nice joint. So that's probably good enough. So we're going to go ahead now and cut out our tailboards. I'll protect the front with a bit of a board, just so we have these clean joints. And we'll give that a go. And that gives us a nice set of pins. You can clearly see the two half pins at the side and the two pins in the middle and then the sockets. And then your joint should just fit together with hand pressure. And there you go, that's your joint. It needs to be seated down obviously on here when we come to do the final glue up, but that will be nice. And as you can see, my tails are slightly proud of my pin board, which is what I want, because that will now clean up nicely. Small tear out here, just on this end pin, which is a bit disappointing, but for the first attempt, that's not too bad. Second job is I now want to put the pins on this end of the board. Now it's gonna be very easy to get this the wrong way round. Remember, we've just cut this with the face towards us and our reference edge. We still need the face towards us, so we've got to spin it through 180 degrees. So my reference edge is now pointing this way, but my face is still towards me. If I now turn the face that way to maintain the reference edge, the joint won't work. So your face is always towards you. You can start to see our drawer is now coming together quite nicely. And that's how you do through dovetails on the Lee Jig. Out of all the joints we've done so far on the Lee Jig, the through dovetails has been the easiest. Now that's my first attempt. Everything seems to be nice and flush. The joints are reasonably tight, except for that little bit of tear out we had there. Uh, and that's going to clamp up and glue really quite well. Obviously this is not seated in this direction just yet but good not bad at all next episode we're going to look at the blind dovetails and can anybody spot the deliberate mistake i made on this draw unit
I'll explain more next time. Thanks for watching. Hope you're finding it useful. See you next time.